So what this session is going to be considering um, is that if you think about what Arun said this morning, that the whole kind of basic research, applied research distinction is actually not that, you know, it's not really there, it's a false dichotomy. Well, I would say it's even more true that if you look at mission-oriented investments, both the ones, you know, that got us to the moon as well as the current ones, and we'll be discussing this later also with the state investment banks around the sort of green transformation, also this kind of early stage seed financing of companies, early, yeah, um, is, has also been one of the roles that the state has played, including in the United States through the Small Business Innovation Research Program, which funded Compaq and Intel, or Apple that was funded initially from the SBIC grant. Um, and so the question is, is this right? You know, should actually government just be focusing on the kind of public good, the obvious public good problem, which would be things like basic research extended a bit towards the applied research, or precisely because private finance has become so financialized, meaning finance funding finance, which is what um, both Andy Haldane and Adair Turner were saying today, do we actually also need public finance doing this kind of early stage seed financing of companies, which really should be coming through private venture capital, but the problem is as venture capital has become, and this is part of the financialization issue, so exit driven, focused on this three year exit, mainly through an IPO, initial public offering, or through a buyout, is that three year period kind of realistic for the really innovative firms <clears throat> that need finance, um, who you know, might need 10, kind of 15 years, or say 10 years, which is the kind of time period, of course, that BNDS offers. We heard that before with the Gran Bio. And if that's true, if this space is a valid one for public finance, in other words, to be like a public venture capitalist, there's two questions, or lots of questions that come up. One is, and you obviously know I don't believe this from how the faces I'll make, you know, can a bunch of bureaucrats, um, <laughs> I should have been an actress, um, bureaucrats make these decisions, or is, you know, is private finance always going to be better at kind of choosing these companies? Um, a. Uh, B. Um, if, you know, given that what we know from the private VC industry is there's huge failures, right, um, but what they have is the ability to retain equity and through that cover the losses and the next round, so Kleiner, Perkins, investment in Genentech was, you know, hugely profitable for Kleiner, Perkins and more than covered their losses and the next round. If, big if, if there is a justification for the public sector to be providing this kind of public VC, should we also do what is done in places like Israel, where this kind of you know, equity stakes are in fact retained, which of course doesn't happen in places like the US. Um, and, and so this is the whole issue about socializing risks and rewards, not just the risks, also due to the tax questions we mentioned before. Now, Gordon and Murray were very lucky that he is one of the top academic experts in the world thinking precisely about this public-private VC um, uh, situation. We're going to have Peter Youngen, who's a uh, is an individual venture capitalist. I mean, it's a company, but you are, huh? It's your company, right? I'm an angel. Angel, angel investor. Can I have the bio list? I should have. <laughs> been an angel you always meet okay, the I'm wrong people. <laughs> you meet only devils, obviously. <laughs> Business angel, but he but he and I don't have a we we, we have more of a devilish relationship, don't we? Um, I will tell my daughter. I tell Tom you, Heller, Carolina. who. Um, I don't have the bio, so I'm actually just telling you right now what I know about them. Sorry, this is very unprofessional. Tom Heller, who is the director and I think founder no? of the Climate Policy Initiative in California, initially funded by George Soros, another wonderful angel um, with 100 million, no? that's what he gave you? <laughs> this wasn't in the bio, this is the, the gossip part. Um, very um, interesting um, initiative, by the way, we use lots of their data. It's probably one of the best along Bloomberg New Energy Finance for actually looking at these questions. We use their data to precisely look at who's financing what in the uh, climate finance landscape. Um, Christian here runs the Danish Growth Fund. Uh, tell us the name in Danish. Vekstfonden. Yes, okay. Um, and I recently gave a talk um, at one of their events and talking to Christian, what was fascinating was precisely this issue that you kind of can't win because, you know, if you are public VC, you have a portfolio, and as any portfolio, you have the high risk, low risk, but when they're funding the low risk, they get accused for being inertial. When they find the high risk, they're, they're accused of wasting taxpayer money. So hopefully we're gonna sort of tease you out on how to deal with that kind of challenge and accusation. And as I said, Gordon is the um, discussant. Uh, right, so we start with, should we go in this order? 
Uh, Gordon, is, is this order we decided we were going to go in? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah, what, was there a better order? No, no, that's yeah. fine. Okay, so Tom, do you want to? Gee, I think, okay. But, um, <laughs> that, well, that's what it says here. <laughs> Whatever it is. And unlike the other sessions, we have some students or PhD or someone who's going to actually PhDs. put up signs that are going to make you feel really guilty if you go beyond the zero mark. <laughs> I have five minutes for the whole thing? Yeah. No, 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 no. Ten. No, Ten. Oh, they start with the two, and then you get five. <laughs> <laughs> and that what am I supposed to, how much time am I supposed to? <laughs> Ten minutes. All right. All right. Um, it's okay. I'm still, you know, when you fly in from California on the overnight flights, jet lag sets in just about now. Uh, so uh, <laughs> it, should, it should be, if I fall asleep here, you'll wake me up. The, uh, so, uh, I mean, Mariana has posed uh, in her inimitable way all sorts of questions to which I don't have answers. I, I don't think I'm going to talk at all about early stage um, uh, research or demonstration projects. Like, you know, since Ken Arrow, we all have a sense that there's a strong public role there, and uh, we know it's very hard to evaluate it. I've spent a lot of time in the Chinese academies of science, and so, you know, they spend more than the U.S., but uh, doesn't mean there are results there, and people have alluded to um, the national systems of innovation. So I'm going to stay away from that. Uh, I will say, as someone who has spent a lot of time in the low-carbon economy or climate work now, way too much of my life, 22 years, um, uh, that um, the, 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 the opposite side, looking at the at, at, at outcomes um, in the uh, scaling up and commercialization phases of innovation, which I think Mariana has put a lot of attention to in, in her own work, is very difficult because you get the same thing you always get uh, when you bring out the people. They stand up there and they tell you what fantastic things they're doing in their companies or, if you will, in their agencies. But you never know where it falls on the distribution scale. You know, it could be in the 90th percentile. It's some odd thing that they're doing. And the assertion is this is about to become the mean. But after 22 years of it not becoming the mean, you start to worry that it's simply the kind of stuff that when I used to build models, we would put into some parameter of expected change, energy efficiency, whatever it was. And that's simply the normal, it doesn't mean that it, there's, there is real change in the system coming up. So if I had any time, um, which I don't, I would try and say four things about the clean energy space that people have talked about. Um, I, I would say first that we have uh, structured the, this area around the, uh, around the figure, around the idea that the climate policy would be the driver, and it would have certain impacts on innovation, basically some form of induced innovation. Um, that hasn't worked, and it's not going to work. Okay, that's, that's one proposition I put in front of you. However, um, when we back off the idea that climate policy as the subject of international agreement um, is, is the driver of innovation uh, in these sectors, uh, and, and we actually looked at what happens, and we look at national policies and national um, um, architectures of how policy is done, the record is, is really not bad. Um, it's, it's pretty good, and we could talk about the reasons why that has occurred. Um, but much of this has been occluded, has been hidden, that is the success of these national policies, however they were actually uh, institutionalized because uh, another good thing, in addition to the success of policy, which is the incredible rate of growth that we have experienced, which if you go back to 1992, no one thought Asia was going to grow the way it, that it has. And so demand has gone up enormously, and it's gone up in parts of the world where the installed or um, uh, relative price advantage is in an energy system which was fossil fuel driven, in some cases coal driven. So we have a tremendous buildup of 
uh, of demand due to growth which then lead to emissions, which make it appear that the situation is getting worse, whereas actually policy has done a good deal. The third point that I would make is that um, the, uh, there is room to improve the policies within the context of the current uh, energy systems, and I could do this with agriculture as well, the other major source of climate uh, risk, uh, there is very substantial room to do improvement and various forms of policy uh, reform are in place that carry uh, more hope of, of, of seeing changes in the inflection of, of the curve of emissions that um, would have been predicted. But I think at a certain point things run into limits. In other words, whether it's in the agriculture system or where industrial organization in much of the world where agriculture is expanding is basically built around small businesses without agribusiness. Or in the energy sector where at a certain point you begin to destabilize the model uh, of, of energy uh, organization that we have had since the rise of the central power system. The financing that went along with that, the way business models are conducted by utility level uh, systems. That gets destabilized at a certain point. And my sense is that really this story told well and in more than 10 minutes uh, demands that you flip the place of innovation. Instead of innovation beginning as an artifact that is induced at the sectoral level by climate policy, generally reflected in a rising climate and a rising price of carbon, what we actually will find is that it is the logic of an exogenously driven innovation. Not exogenously driven in the sense that when we look across the history of economic growth and productivity improvement, we do not see structural change. Here I get very close to what Carlotta was, was saying last night, um, and quite specifically I'm relatively close to where Arun uh, Majumbar was talking this morning because to me it is the app use applications that are developing of the network that will transform both energy and agriculture, the two sources of climate change. It is not driven by climate policy, but it has climate effects for fundamental economic reasons. And so for me the question is invariably what a number of people have alluded to. What is the pace and the scale at which this transformation takes place. I think I know what the future looks like, assuming we have a future. The question is how much damage we do in the meanwhile. And there are certain ideas that we could talk about, but most of those ideas at this point, I would say, are not hard technology. They are the attributes of business organization, finance, policy, or institutional arrangements that constitute the complements to technology change that always involve or always are involved in structural change. The problems, and, and I'll allude to some of those in just a second, um, I have two minutes to go, so it'll be a very quick second. The problems are the problems of structural change rather than the problems of climate change per se that I think are really in front of us. So what I'm doing is flipping the logic it's not that a rising climate price politically imposed will induce sectoral innovation, which is what we saw. And it's obvious to anyone who's seriously engaged in those negotiations that that's not going to happen at any price which is adequate to really produce those induced effects. What is happening is for other reasons, the systems are Technology systems are changing in a way that will make zero marginal cost energy the economically successful solution. Okay? But the question is the pace and resistance, and I will use my last few seconds um, to say something about that. Uh, I, I want to make one set of remarks. The system that we have developed for climate uh, has, has been done in 1992 and thereafter. Right? Around the same time, we made fundamental changes in the energy sector that demonopolized part of that center, sector, put in competition, and moved us away from pure state finance to needing to leverage private finance in most of the world. In Brazil, 
In China, where you have remaining state development systems, the performance has been quite different. But it's been different because the financial system is differently organized. Is that good or bad? I can go into that in some length. I've spent lots of people here from Brazil better equipped than I to talk about that, although we talk a lot. I spend a lot of time in China. And if we were to have a discussion about how the state banking system in China intersects with state ownership and intersects with the policy provisions and treasury behavior that moves capital around relatively fluidly within the Chinese system, that's a long story. It is, in my view, completely non-comparable to what we see in the West and we are often discussing as an alignment between public and private capital, and we've tried to write about that a lot. Okay, just as my closing remarks, um, I think that if you are seriously thinking about structural change, and remember I've said there are lots of things that we can do to lower the cost of capital, which has been built up during 100 years of financing variable cost fuels and the risk structures that are reflected in the equity and, and premia reflect those sets of risks that do not appear when you're running renewables because you're running at zero marginal cost um, on, on those renewables and you have, uh, you're not managing fuel risk, which is the main thing you pay utilities for to get an equity return. So we can do financial engineering that will drive down prices and I think we're really on the verge of doing that. And that's certainly one of the things that, that my organization or that Arun was talking about with, with his Google funds. I'm just gonna throw that out there as a teaser. The last thing I would say is there are four things we really have to look at on the financial side. One, what does the movement to an energy system which is essentially prepaid, because renewable energy is nearly all capital and very, very little in terms of operating costs. What does it mean to the total cost of capital? Okay, because if we push the total cost of capital up by 10% or 10 basis points, I have every treasury minister in the world on my back saying, get away from me, because I can't support that price across the system. Second, I have to worry about the micro-organization of finance. And again, as I just said, there are things that we can do there in municipal finance and yield co and other structures that are relatively nerdy, um, but there are things that we can certainly do. I think a third question that's extremely important has to do with fixed capital and the relationship between capital organization and governance. That is to say, it is a very, very subtle thing to try and have a series of cues, either in the sense that the public sector makes certain contributions, whether they're in the form of equity, debt, wraps, uh, guarantees, credit enhancements. It is a very subtle thing to align private behavior because you have to understand the private business models and how these things fit in. And we've been having lots of trouble with that. One way to avoid that is to move to state banking where you get coordination in quite a different way. So my suggestion is there is a relationship between finance, governance, and the fixed capital needs of infrastructure that have to change when you get deeper penetration. The last thing I would say, which is extremely important, and here I throw it back to Carlotta, and this is the, a provocation, if you will. We have done tremendous analysis of the so-called stranded asset problem, okay, which people talk about in financial markets all the time. Let me just give you the conclusions. When we look across the world, oil, coal, gas, power, 90% of the value at risk is in the hands of government. Private sector has almost none of that. Why is that? State ownership, state banks, taxes, production sharing arrangements, it is all in the hands of governments. The problem is we know that governments are long-term investors, right? That's what this is all about, private actors. Although I spent a lot of time in the BP boardroom and I'm not sure where the term of her, the horizon is longer, but governments are long-term investors. The fleets in China and India that have been built up during the period of high growth are 15 to 20 years old. They're coal fleets, they're owned by the government, and government taxes flow from them. Okay. You tell me which government is going to strand its own balance sheet, okay? and which government is going to give up its budgetary revenues that it's receiving from a fleet that it owns 
in order to move toward low carbon. And then maybe we start to have a serious discussion. Thank you. Peter, you're next. No, on the mm. schedule. No, no, Talk. I'm told, I, I'm only promised here that I will be speaking last. Really? Yeah. By who? Ten minutes ago, mm. by you. By me? <laughs> ah, you're right, you did ask I me that. I can speak Sorry. again <laughs> if you want to. Okay, <laughs> you speak again. And this, is before, right. this is before the drinks. Okay. Um, right, so, Christian. Okay. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Someone obeys. All right. Okay. I do. And um, thank you so much, Marianne, for coming to our annual meeting in Denmark uh, to teach and entertain our 1,200 attendees mm -hmm. of uh, businessmen. If we can do this uh, just half as entertaining here, we have done a good job. Um, who are we? Uh, the Danish Growth Fund, um, you know, um, Denmark, a small country the size of an Australian sheep farm, close by, five and a half million inhabitants. Um, we we um, are 100% government owned. Um, and uh, our job is to finance uh, small and medium sized um, enterprises so they can grow and create uh, more and better jobs uh, and eventually return the money to, uh, to us um, uh, with a small profit, uh, hopefully. That's basically our mission. We, um, um, we were founded in 92. We have a base capital of $400 million, capital under management of some $2 billion. And um, we, we do direct investments, we do indirect investments via funds, and also we do uh, direct loans, in particular um, um, syndicated loans. Um, we do 500 to 800 financing annually, and um, our aim this year is to uh, create about 8,000 jobs um, in, in about 2,000 companies. Uh, when it comes to the very important part of our job, which is to um, finance the new technology-based companies. It's not only a job of financing the companies, it's also a job of lifting the entire industry, uh, lifting the capacity of the industry to finance the companies and also increasing the number of new technology-based companies that is started up. And this uh, job really encounters a number of uh, serious challenges and issues. Um, and it involves really dealing with the uh, well-known uh, valley of death. Um, the government, is, they have a preference for dealing with this problem by way of providing um, finance for the very early stages um, of the companies, um, by way of uh, providing uh, grants and also equity. But in fact, this policy, if it is a standalone policy, is self-defeating. And why is that so? Because if the government um, motivates more entrepreneurs to start up, they will do so. They will do so. They will start up the companies by government grants or by government equity. And they, the more companies now, will chase fewer um, <coughs> private capital. And the prices of the companies will fall, and they will scream and shout, and more of them will die in the valley of death. And also this policy of, 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 uh, of taking equity uh, in, in young companies is self-defeating because whenever you put equity, whenever you finance a company, there will be more financing rounds. And if you have not follow-on capital, uh, you will be like, diluted in the end and it, it, you will end up better off if you had supplied just a simple loan. So what we prefer is to build the bridge over this value of death uh, in the, in the left-hand part of it by soft money alone. When it comes to the capital market and enlarging this capital market, we prefer to deal by way of hard money. The job is really here to build on, to leverage uh, the private industry's capacity. But the problem is that in most countries in our part of the world, uh, the continental Europe, the market, the private market, is very, very, very small and really non-functioning. So you have to build it up yourself. And that's what we have done. We have actually built up a VC, a shadow VC fund within the Danish Growth Fund. 
and spun it out in 2007, which is now called Sunstone Capital and is the largest VC structure in the Nordics. So you have to build it up yourself. You have to build new capacities. In most countries, VCs, they are bankers types of people and you need industrialists. So you have to bring in other um, profiles of people to build up this market. So you need two pillars of policies really. One is soft money pillar, which is a bureaucratic kind of culture that you will have to build up. It's got to be transparent, long-term, predictable, on fixed terms. The businessmen who run um, the, uh, the VC funds, they will have to look into their lifespan of investments, and which is at least one decade. The other pillar is a business culture you have to build up, and that is our job in the Danish Growth Fund. It has to be uh, run by businessmen with business acumen. They, they got to know uh, the language and the way um, they run the business out there, uh, the commercial contracts, how to make the commercial contracts in, a, in an optimal way, uh, seen from the perspective of the companies and the other investors. It's got to be flexible, uh, deep pocket, proactive, no subsidies, and in the end, they will have to go for profits. This is um, really the culture that we are building up. And building such a culture up really involves um, um, pushing um, on two uh, sides um, uh, of a straight. Uh, and it's really illustrated here um, by a picture uh, of um, Odysseus uh, as he uh, tried to navigate against uh, the Strait of Messina. Uh, and he had to choose between confronting uh, two different kinds of sea monsters. One was, one was the uh, six-headed sea monster to the right. It's called Skylle. Um, and Skylle threatened to uh, eat his sailors. And at the other side of the, uh, of the strait, there was another sea monster called um, Charybdis. And Charybdis was a, a, a whirlpool that threatened to drag the ship uh, down to the bottom and, and that's exactly the kind of navigation that we, as a hard money government entity, faces every day. Uh, either we can, we can confront the, the whirlpool, uh, we can take on very, very, very long term and very, very, very high risk. And, if, and we will most likely run a short to medium term um, loss and we will lose credibility and there is a high risk that we will be closed down. Because short-termism uh, is not limited to the um, investment market. It's, it's also applied in the government and in the financial media. So don't confront the whirlpool. Confront the uh, six-headed sea monster uh, instead. You would have to build up a more mixed portfolio not only the very, very, very long-term, very high risk, but also less risky uh, businesses uh, to reap a short-term profit that you can build up a credible platform for your long-term business. And that's indeed what we are uh, doing. Um, the good news is that the financial crisis actually has, has uh, widened um, uh, the Straits of, uh, of Messina and, uh, and we are uh, sailing into more smooth uh, water. Um, the times are better and, uh, and we have to prove now that we can uh, exit some companies and we can uh, uh, do a, a decent profit uh, and have a decent return of the capital invested over the last uh, 15 years and I believe that we will be able to show that. Uh, that concludes my um, uh, statements and I think I'm the very first to hold on to the um, time limits. Uh, thank you so much. Am I allowed? <coughs> OK, thank you very much for inviting me. I know you, you are a risk-taking woman, and to invite me is a risk from your point of view, at least, <laughs> as we have maybe different views on a few issues. And, this conference is about innovation, and when we talk here about private and public venture, uh, capital and, and socializing risk and rewards, then of course it's about financing of innovation, and therefore 
I, I want to have two minutes on uh, that topic. What has created growth and wealth and well-being in the world? It's innovation. How through market systems, or other people call it capitalism, what is the driving force, entrepreneurs and risk-taking investors? What is the precondition for innovation? It's knowledge. What, where does the knowledge come from? Experimentation and uh, R&D and research. Um, at about, until about 1500 or so, uh, people there was the belief that everything uh, which uh, we can know was known. Uh, and uh, so it's no surprise that GDP per capita in uh, 1780, according to Madison, was about exactly the same number as 10,000 before Christ. So everything that happened in the world happened since then, and uh, through innovation, and basically, and, and it, it followed then with the Scottish Enlightenment, the Renaissance, the Scottish Enlightenment, and the, of course, uh, the emergence of uh, uh, industrialization and the emergence of capitalism in this very country where we are. What is needed for the innovation? We need, of course, R&D, as I said. We need the scientists um, driving uh, invention or creating invention, new knowledge. This is the key. And then we need the entrepreneurs uh, who are tra as transfer agents to transfer the new knowledge into new products and services. So basically, you could say the difference between invention and innovation would be uh, in invention would be turning money into knowledge, and the innovation part is turning knowledge into money. Is there a role for government? Yes, you would be surprised. Um, uh, there it is, but rather in the invention part, in the R&D, in the education, in particular early childhood education. Uh, looking on uh, Jim Hackman's great study he's doing it in China now with 230,000 uh, young uh, babies, um, uh, schools and the first class universities. Um, and the framework conditions in place for entrepreneurship, startups, and the financing of innovation. As the key driver uh, in this uh, new book, uh, uh, Bryn Johnson and McGaffey say, life has been pretty boring uh, and, uh, until uh, 30,000 before, uh, 30, uh, before Christ. There was the Neanderthaler, and when, only when they left us and died out, there was a chance but still between 10,000 before Christ and uh, the 17th or 16th century, not very much uh, happened. Growth rate between 1,000 uh, before Christ and 1,700 was 0.1% um, of GDP. Since then, it's 1.5. I think we can all imagine what that basically means. Europe is in a mess, in a way. The only way out for Europe is through innovation and innovate, uh, increasing innovation uh, pace. Um, but how does it start? We have in the U.S. Um, a startup culture and entrepreneurship culture, which is um, not beaten yet in the world anywhere. Mm. Uh, we don't have anything similar in uh, Europe uh, until now. But before I, uh, by, before I come that, um, even Karl Marx acknowledged uh, the performance of uh, capitalism. He calls it the bourgeoisie. And he said in the manifest that in the last 100 years, the bourgeoisie created more wealth in the world than all generations of mankind before altogether. Um, he, he drew the wrong conclusions, of course, for that. Um, if you look on the world since the end of the, com of the communism, uh, 80 countries in the world have grown 3.5% uh, faster per year than the US or the EU. And that basically is the fa the follows the fact that for the first time in history, the vast majority of people living in countries who have accepted uh, a, cap a capitalist system or market economy for those who shy away from the world capitalism. If you look on the Global Innovation Index from 2014, organized by WIPOS, they have 190 countries in the list. The interesting thing is uh, there are uh, the first 70 uh, or so, uh, they have two criteria. Uh, uh, they are democracies and have capitalism or market economy. Uh, then you have another 30 who are so-so. And, and then um, uh, if I add it up correctly, you have another 70 and they have neither democracy nor capitalism. And uh, there seems to be a relationship, with, but we can't go in to this. People are saying, is that the end of innovation or there's the secular stagnation and all this? I don't believe this. This is a very Western-centered uh, Western, um, view. There are seven billion almost in the world of which uh, only a bracket is yet working on, the, on a globalized uh, market. 
uh, the, the number of people uh, who were serving the world market is now about one and a half to two million. We had this 500 when the wall came down. It will be in about 20 or 30 years, it will be four billion. Do we believe that these people have no ideas and will not contribute to innovation pace? I don't believe this. Why do we take that? I think a pretty arrogant view, or it's a, the people like in the bus. The bus is full and they say, okay, we close the door, sorry for you guys, we, we can't take you on in this, in this world. What we're seeing is the renaissance in China and basically mentioned before, innovation pace now in China seems to be large, higher than at least in Europe. Um, and therefore, um, I'm not afraid of that we are missing out uh, on this in the world. Uh, startups is the key for driving innovation. Uh, the majority of startups uh, fail. Uh, three out of four don't make uh, uh, the first five years. Um, the highest percentage uh, or in absolute numbers of people employed in startups which have been created five years uh, before the service were taken by the Glo Global Entrepreneurship Monitor was in China with 80 million people. So we can see what it is in that employment is uh, created uh, largely by young firms who have been uh, created uh, five years ago or even uh, younger. Uh, to be an entrepreneur doesn't really pay off. Uh, most don't make it, so uh, if you count them, uh, the median entrepreneur is underwater, uh, or at least the median startup will be underwater, so how are we convincing young people to start a business? if most of them will fail, so we need a winner culture, not only, but a failure culture, to, to allow for failure, very difficult in Europe, a change in bankruptcy laws in Europe, and they said, look at the, the history. The car industry started off with about 3,000 firms in the US. 30 of them had an IPO, two and a half almost are remaining now. It, it sounds very similar to studies of these days uh, where we see with 10,000 business ideas, 10,000 firms are created, 100 receive funding, uh, 10 have an IPO, and two become global leaders. And at a conference said the rep high representative of the German Ministry of Economics, oh, we always wanted to choose uh, and pick the winner. Um, unfortunately, he didn't understand that he didn't understand anything uh, about the entrepreneurial process and how this works. We come to the conclusion that uh, for wealth creation, probably the governments need more the entrepreneurs than the, the entrepreneur need the government. It doesn't mean that the governments have not a substantial role in putting the right framework condition, but many people in Europe now start the business somewhere else. Why? Because the entrepreneurial framework conditions are much more in favor, for instance, in the United States with all the flops they have there, but 500 of the largest uh, companies in the world uh, who have been founded in the last 30 years, uh, 30 in the US and three in Europe. Um, now, what is that? There are a lot of reasons which we cannot go into, uh, but to finance the, in, uh, the institution and to finance the startup, we need equity. We don't need loans. Uh, and we need um, seed capital for that. Uh, important for the startup is where the capital is invested. This is very important uh, where a society invests the capital. It's the venture capital industry, but if you look on the uh, development in the last uh, couple of years, uh, it's uh, very unfortunate that Europe is pretty underdeveloped in that respect. In the first quarter of this year, uh, the venture capital fundraising in the US doubled over the quarter before. Uh, 2013 was a very high year for that. Uh, venture capital in the world is invested roughly, if you take per capita of the population, 120 US dollars in the US, 250 in Israel, uh, about 12 in the EU, uh, about uh, five in the Eurozone, and already three to four in China, which means basically China has more venture capital investment than uh, Europe. The numbers in Europe are down in 13, and in the first quarter of uh, 14, and therefore, the unfortunate thing is uh, that we are losing out uh, in the innovation pace. We're down to 3.4 million, a billion in uh, Europe in last year, and uh, in the US was uh, 28 uh, billion venture capital and 25 billion uh, angel investing. So if there's all over 50 billion in the US, the comparable number to Europe to be benign is uh, 500 uh, million. And I think we can imagine what it basically uh, means for the pace of um, innovation. Um, in the present uh, year, 
we probably see a shift in this. There will be less venture capital being invested in traditional markets, more goes into emerging markets. But jumping over Europe, that's a, a very bad uh, situation which we can, uh, which we can see uh, for that. And therefore, let me close with a remark on this angel investing. Business angels are basically un undercover, uncovered, under-researched, underestimated, unknown, undervalued, but overtaxed. And uh, therefore, uh, we need, what are they doing? They invest uh, entrepreneurial capacity, uh, networking, contact, and capital, and capital, and in that order. In the first, uh, in 2013, in the United States, were 25 billion invested in 70,000 firms with 300,000 angel investing, 45% is seed. So the bulk of seed financing and pre-seed in the US is angel investing. It's almost not known here. Uh, we probably, if we're lucky in Europe, we may have uh, three, four, five hundred. Um, you almost can count it. It's a very underdeveloped part of the underdeveloped venture capital industry uh, anyway. Um, the 75% uh, of all venture capital and 90% of all angel investing in the world is done in the United States and it's the secret of the dynam dynamism of the US economy. And it's no wonder uh, that this huge uh, ICT business in the US uh, are funded all and started up in the, uh, in the United uh, um, States. Um, I know that my time is over, but I have one or few um, very short conclusions out of this. Is there, as I said at the beginning, a role for government besides R&D and besides the um, <coughs> besides education and uh, starting with early childhood uh, education. If you look on the funds in Europe, uh, we have a number of government uh, supported co-funding in Europe is already 40% of the venture capital is uh, uh, government funded, uh, more than 50% in Germany. So when you look on the meager numbers of venture capital in Germany, always think that more than 50 or 60% is taxpayer uh, um, money. And, um, we, uh, we, we have the problem and that it, it became said, was said before that some of the public funds, can they really escape the political pressure or the political cronies, objectives, the constituencies and all this? I don't have the answer, but I have a, a problem with this. Uh, is this a market failure uh, or is it rather a political failure that this financing of innovation doesn't flow. The Commission talks always about innovation. You, Europe was supposed to become the most dynamic, uh, knowledge-based economic region in the world. This is Lisbon agenda. They all fail. They now have another 10-year plan. It's called EU 2020. You have eight, uh, eight, 28 pages on innovation. But the word entrepreneur was in the first draft not once. In the second draft, it's included now, but only with the notion that an entrepreneur, if he fails, should have a second chance. So it was basically a kind of social policy for entrepreneurs, proving that they had no idea uh, what it really is. It was said before about patient and long-term investing. I'm not so sure I, I know. I think that um, a lot of investors, uh, one of the founders of Aldi died last week. Uh, in the age of 94, and they've been the business of 60 years or more, and almost 70 uh, in this. The estimate is that the biggest contribution to the public is that they uh, created a level, a downward level for food prices in Germany of up to 15% over the last 40 or 50 years. Imagine what that does to the budget of the ordinary uh, guy. Um, and then, it's been said also last night, long-term investors may be they, that they, they, they're not long-term investing enough, uh, and, but maybe that the long-term investors, maybe they find out uh, um, um, that um, uh, on, in, in a short term that the S, um, investment will fail over long term, and therefore maybe the government doesn't find exactly the people they want to have. The government as an entrepreneur or as an inventor may be for the last one, but distribution of returns between entrepreneurs and the society, but what about the entrepreneurs who fail? Maybe those are the first people who should be given some of the rewards, if at all, because they at least have given it a try. And I, I'm, I was just my last sentence. Um, one major uh, uh, flawed concept is our taxation system. It, be, it was said by Adair and it's been said in a lot of talks, because it basically favors debt 
and discriminates equity. Now, we don't have to be surprised that our society is becoming debt-oriented, if that is favored by taxation, and is not equity-oriented, if, if equity is tax-wise discriminated. We can do this in the debate, but have no time to do that. And Mariana, thank you for the graciousness to give me probably three and a half more minutes. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. A risk taker, I think I'm more of a sado masochista. <laughs> I thought I was, how do you say, whipping myself with black leather. <laughs> My Italian is not good enough to re respond to that. <laughs> just as well. You've just heard an hour's talk given at four times the speed normally given. Uh, I enjoyed Christian's metaphor, the Scylla and Charybdis. Because I think from my experience, most entrepreneurs would see the Scylla as the bankers and see the Charybdis as the equity players. And because of that, actually most entrepreneurs, most small businesses don't actually seek external equity. Certainly if we look at the SME Finance Monitor, only about 1% of fast growth businesses in a 30,000 sample in the UK was actually seeking external equity. That might be quite important to this debate, but what I want to do is perhaps just raise some of the issues around the role of venture capital. And this kind of links back to our first discussant's comment Dan Bresnitz, talking about the two key roles of experimentation and killing. Venture capitalists are good, particularly at the latter. Venture capital is part of what we call very often in the UK a financial escalator. That starts with the entrepreneur's own money, family, friends and fools, business angels, often fallen angels, venture capital, then on to uh, wider scale finance, uh, particularly debt and other products. What we know is that as an escalator, it's characterized by lots of missing steps, lots of holes, lots of shaky pieces of wood and metal, and many entrepreneurs fall through it. Government likes venture capital in part because it just seems so damn sexy, much more sexy than banking. And also, we have the image of Silicon Valley. That is how everyone sees venture capital. And time and again, I am asked, how do we create Silicon Valley in country X or Y or Z? And I always say the same thing. It's really very simple, declare war on Japan. Because what we're saying is you cannot emulate American history. And perhaps you don't want to emulate American history. Because with few exceptions, venture capital is characterized by failed investments, poor investments, delayed investments, and a risible return on the funds invested. Over several years, the broad average return on venture capital is about 1%. That is not a very good risk-adjusted reward. Now, the likes of the Kleiner Perkins and a handful of primarily American venture capitalists are the exception to this rule, but they are the exception. So really when politicians are in love with venture capital, my first word of advice is like when supping them with the devil, eat with a long spoon. And above all, start to research the phenomenon you're looking at. Government, while finding it interesting, has become more involved because the venture capital industry has moved away from the garage startup. I remember asking American venture capitalists, do you invest one, two million dollars 
in young, exciting ideas at pre-commercialization stages. And he looked at me rather sort of oddly and said, we don't do pocket money. And what he was saying essentially was, if you understand incentives in venture capital, and particularly the incentives to the key practitioners, the general partners, you will understand why they have moved higher and higher up the financing chain and left government, business angels, and others to do the tough stuff, to do the hard stuff, and to do the risky stuff. So government very often is obligated to be involved at this stage because essentially if they weren't an innovation policy, then clearly bank debt is highly inappropriate. And in this area, governments have had to learn how to undertake this activity. And they've, under, they've learned, just like the venture capital industry, slowly and often very painfully. I'm sure Christian would agree, some of the earlier um, programs in venture capital across Europe and beyond were badly organized, badly operated, with often facile objectives. And one other thing in this, what you're seeing with the venture capital industry, which we, we laud, the private venture capital industry, is it's highly discriminating. If we're looking in terms of major infrastructure bill, which is the, the key issue here, in that if we take uh, environment, the venture capital industry isn't really involved in the whole environmental set of issues. Clean technology blazed up three or four or five years ago. And certainly the statistics showed it blazed down pretty quickly for two reasons. It takes a lot of money, it takes a lot of skill, and it takes a lot of time. Those are all in very high constraint. Where you see the venture capital industry work is when you can have, as Mariana said, a turnaround of three, three years from first contact, refinancing, to ideally an exit. And so you see in the UK and you see in America, the two most sophisticated venture capital industries along with, with Israel, is a predominant interest in things like software. ICT. Biotech at the very last stage. I mean, I see biotech as a marathon of 25 miles, and I see venture capitalists coming in at the last 100, year, 100 yards before the finishing line. And the rest of the journey is government. So you have a situation where if we're going to use this model in a wider context, we need to be very clear what venture capital and the venture capital industry does well and what they do less well. And I think the critical thing here is the understanding of risk because venture capitalists are very good at pricing risk and managing portfolios. And increasingly, I have to say, the likes of Weixfond and, and others are equally as good at this. The, the venture capital industry has learned and the public venture capital industry has learned dramatically and it, you only need to know, look at, say, the British government's effort in uh, enterprise capital funds and others to, to look at really high quality structures. But what the venture capital industry does not like is uncertainty. And what you have in this big industry build, you don't have risk. Risk you can price and you can manage by saying yes or no, but you have uncertainty. And venture capital is completely inimical with uncertainty. It just doesn't physically know how to handle it within the structure of a 10-year fund. And so what I think one will have to evolve, and I'm not sure how this is going to be done, but I think you're going to have to look at the best of the state bank type structures with their long-term perspective their commitments, and frankly, in many cases, their vision. And you're going to have to ally that with the profound level of industry knowledge, industry skills, and the management of growing sectors that you see in the best of the venture capital industry. But this initiative, finally, I would say, will have to come 
from government much more as an equal partner. In the past, I think government has been treated in a way very aggressively by the agents in the venture capital industry. And that will not be tenable in these long-term structures. Whether or not we can learn them, I don't know. But I think that the likes of Brazil and China will give some really interesting illustrations. And one final comment, which we haven't talked about at all, and that there's a lot of work on the role of the rule of law within sectors and the role of venture capital. In my opinion, the only areas where venture capital has worked or has a chance of working is where there is a transparent, fair, and just legal system which has protected the rights of the individual. That is going to be a huge, huge problem for the venture capital and private equity that we see in the Far East, and particularly China. Don't put all your eggs on that basket at the moment. And on that patronizing note, I shall finish. Okay, we're going to open it up um, right now. I, I just want to have a sort of one comment as chair that I think this kind of, you know, 10 to 15 year period, or as you said, you know, 25 mile stretch in the last 100 yards. I think there's two issues there. One is the um, is the issue that both I and Bill Janeway raise in our sort of two different but complementary books, where we're talking about the VCs. Uh, Bill, I think, says it in terms of uh, dancing on the platform created by government. I say surfing the wave, because it mainly happened in California. And the degree to which they have been surfing on, if you want, the basic and applied R&D. There's another, right, so actually using this huge amount of state investments and then actually seeking out where those are and actually then going to finance companies in those areas. So it's not about more entrepreneurial culture, as Peter was, was suggesting, but we can debate this a bit more, but more certain countries having more of these kind of direct mission-oriented investments in areas of high capital intensity, high market and technological risk, where VC doesn't fund, and them actually entering those spaces precisely because those are the areas that they're not gonna fund and they come in later. Another question, however, has been raised by some research by Fred Block recently, just last year, where he did a survey of um, companies that were financed by private venture capital in California and found that lots of them went first to the private venture capital uh, you know, funds and were told, told, first go to the SBIR program. Right, which is not about basic research. Right? This is, again, a type of, it's not exactly public venture capital, it's, it's happening mainly through procurement, but still, it's you know, government money going to specific companies. This isn't basic research. And then come back to us. Right? That also raises all sorts of very complicated questions. And I think one of the issues is, and this is something that Bill Azonik and I raised in a paper we wrote called Risks and Rewards and Innovation, that precisely because innovation is not a random walk, it's cumulative, it's path dependent, it's persistent. The returns, which yes, take 15 to 20 years, are cumulative, right? So if you have a cumulative distribution curve and you have some agents entering late, using Gordon's words in the last 100 yards, and yet policymakers, uh, you know, with these, how do you say, rosy eyes, as Gordon was also talking about, their love for the VC community, what we have actually seen are policies that have actually allowed these venture capitalists, some of them, the most successful ones, to capture the entire integral underneath that curve. In the UK, this happened, by the way, through a labor government policy, which in 2002 reduced the time that private equity has to be invested to get these massive tax reductions from 10 years to two years. Labor government thinking, oh, we want Silicon Valley, we're gonna do this by detaxing them completely. You know, it's also these very ill-advised policies which come from hyping up some actors, which are extremely important, but they're not the only actors in this innovation ecosystem. Okay, open up to questions. Paul Nightingale had his hand up before we even... Uh... Um, I didn't, but I'll uh, come up with a question. Um, <laughs> this is what's good about being chair. You can choose people. Gordon, um, thank you very much for your, your excellent uh, and refreshing comments. Um, an important part of, uh, of your discussion was killing, uh, and you, you, you've focused mainly on the, the risk management and portfolio management element of this. An important kind of message to get across is, is in a competitive economy, there will be lots of firms that will seek funding and don't deserve to be funded. 
And a good part of the economic system is to kind of kill those firms and recycle that managerial skill and technology. Have you got any comments on how that bit of it can be improved? Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll take three at a time, sorry. Um, so who hasn't asked a question at all? So just, okay, so keep, so if you have asked a question, I'm just gonna, okay, um, Matthias? Um, John Murray insisted on that Fauci venture capital can't deal with uncertainty. He repeated it three times. So um, I'm interested in learning from, um, uh, from Christian and from Peter how they deal with uncertainty. Venture capital, we have learned, can't. So uh, therefore, I'm interested in learning how you do it uh, in practical terms. And then another question in the, in the direction of, um, of Tom Heller. He made a point out of these um, um, zero marginal costs, which I find very convincing. Um, mm. But you emphasized also that there, you need a spe specific governance model on this long-term investment. What is this about? Thank you very much. Okay, one more and then we'll take some answers. Um, yeah, in the back. Hi, just follows on from the last question actually. In um, and also directed to Tom. Um, so he said that he, in the future that zero mar marginal cost energy will be the commercial model of choice, but that requires a particular financing model. So I'd just like to hear a bit more about what sort of model he has in mind. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, would that have any impact on whether the investment was in developed or developing countries? Because um, we've done some work looking at renewable investment and in developing countries, the financing makes it much harder still because of the return expectations. And so how would that be influenced? Okay, so Tom, why don't you take the last two, zero marginal cost in this question. Then we'll have um, Peter taking the question about uncertainty and Gordon Hall's question about recycling. Christian oh, Christian, sorry. Mm. Yeah. yeah, sorry, on the uncertainty. On the uh, uncertainty. Okay, so we'll start with Tom. Can I make oh, one sorry. parenthetical point about venture capital, which of course has a very low role in the energy sector? It, it always has. Why? I mean, first, it's been either a state monopoly or a regulated return for it, in the U.S. Uh, venture capital is not going after regulated utility returns. Um, and, but then what does, what does energy produce? What drives energy? Security has been a major driver, whether it's the building of the gas turbines or the, uh, the fracking, which, of course, came out initially of... Uh, of, of, of concerns. Oil crisis has driven it uh, in Brazil. Uh, João Carlos is sitting here in front of me. Brazil has been driven by security issues, whether it was first in the Amazon looking when they couldn't find Amazon oil, they, they went offshore, and then they went to ethanol when the price came. Um, at, or if not that, then often it has been local pollution, but pollution has avoided damage. There's no monetized return, so I don't see why venture capital would ever go near there. Where you actually have a clear reduction in the operating costs, the, the value where, and where you have a market, then private equity and venture has been very important. So for example, we see all over India right now the rise of wind farms, okay? They are provided almost entirely by either relation, relational banking because if Tata or Reliance does it, then they've got relational banking. But the rest is provided by essentially private equity because the Indian system has evolved to the point where the cross subsidies are so heavy, if you enter into the grid-based system, that you are better off developing wind farms. It's just cheaper. And private equity has flowed into that very quickly. Or private equity has flowed enormously quickly into fracking in the US. It's cheaper. Okay, so, so I think a big question is whether you actually see a monetized return that's available here before, before we can say much about uh, the form, and most returns in the energy sector have not been monetized, either because it's been a state monopoly or regulated, or because it involves non-marketized goods like pollution or the social cost of carbon. Um, so that, that's a, that was a parenthetical remark. Um, Policy questions uh, that, that are necessary. My sense is that, uh, that, that basically policy has evolved. The way we divide up in California, we have three different regulators within the energy system. They have relatively siloed jurisdictions 
and these reflect the particular risks and attributes of a system that is on variable cost heavy operations. When they start to have jurisdictional battles with one another over a, a different risk structure, you essentially get a bog down in the system and you don't get system conversion. So my point is, I made a point about stranded assets on the capital side, but in fact incumbency is a problem on the governmental side as well as on the private side. And the incumbency has to shift if for no other reason than to clear away a series of regulations and institutional arrangements that were perfectly optimal under one dominant system but have become serious barriers to movement toward another because the jurisdictional uh, currency is just as good in government as, as you know, the capital currency is in the private sector. Uh, the last question that, that, that was directed was about financing. Um, I think the big problem is that uh, at, at the current time, uh, if you're doing utility scale financing, uh, you, you need to be in a situation where you take out the, uh, the, the equity return, which is not appropriate for the risk that is there, given the fact that you're going to be on the grid and you're not managing fuel risk. So it's yield cost structures, but how you actually do these structures that function like debt but look like equity for tax reasons is, I think, one of the very big things we're looking at right now. It covers all countries in the world except those where you are running a state banking system where debt is being provided at some rate. You know, Giancarlo leaves. It, uh, if, if, if the private market, you know, in Brazil, the, the debt is being provided at five and a half, six percent. Okay, you need that, especially with capital intensive structures that are leveraged at a four to one ratio. So uh, I don't care how you get it. You get it one way or another and then you live with the consequences of that system. But if the debt is running 14 to 15 percent in India, then you've got a problem that's overwhelming. You can't build out except for these cross subsidies that, 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 that may be um, creating a, a, a second or an nth <laughs> best system. Um, so I'm going to make the last point. In, in developing developed, okay, these yield, the, the mismatch in financing, in financial engineering is general to practically all systems. If we got into China, we could talk about how they actually do the financing and that, and, and maybe it doesn't have that problem. But as soon as you're in, one of the things that is very clear is you have very little cross-border flow whether it's the Danish pension funds, the flows are inside Europe, it's a big deal to build a wind farm in Sweden, okay? Why is that? Because you've got serious issues of regulatory risk that, that, that cannot be adequately managed at the present time, and you have, which, which are the experience of what happened with independent power plants in the 1990s, where there was basically an equity squeeze that occurred almost across the developing world, and the other issue is the, we simply can't hedge the foreign currency risk. It's 400 basis points. You add 400 basis points onto capital, you don't get investment. So we have to do something about dealing with the currency risk and the regulatory risk. And there are initiatives there, but I think that's where you can really find improvements over what we have right now. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Christian on uncertainty and then Peter. Uncertainty. Um why can't the VCs deal with uncertainty? Well, they can. Of course they can, and they have to. Some can't, and they're driven out of business. Um, those who can, they calculate, um, they do the math, they know that they have to do at least one home run in every portfolio. One 10x plus. And to do a 10x plus, what, what do you have to do? You have to hand out pocket money and do early stage investments and you have to fail fast and cheap and put your money on the winners. Those who survive the first phases. That's the way to deal with um, uncertainty and that is what the best do and they are those that we are supplying more capital and in the next phases. Equity. And yes. we do. And we do. So you make money on the upside. Exactly. We do. Always. Always, always. Peter. Pari Pesu, we well, call it. Um, that fits probably quite well in this. Uh, one of the reasons why you may have walked away is obviously incentive systems. 
by the way, to, uh, uh, walked away from the garage and left the, created an equity gap, uh, which is now being tried to be filled by um, uh, bootstrapping, one thing. The second is 3F money, uh, family, friends, and fools. Mm -hmm. And uh, the third is the angel, uh, business angel, and maybe the normal angel or serial uh, angels, and they more and more take the role of the early stage financing of venture capital firms. You have now, you have super angels, people who invest 10, 20 million uh, in, uh, in their portfolio, and you have people who are substituting the smaller funds. Uh, venture capital doesn't invest more or less on below 10 million, and therefore, I don't quite follow with the, the last 100 meters. This is maybe for private equity, where they invest a billion and then uh, have, <coughs> have um, maybe uh, they do 50% or what, and then after three years, uh, they, they come out and do for 1.5 billion. But this has nothing to do with venture capital, what we're talking about. So I think there's a lot of confusion even in that. Um, why do we, <coughs> it has to do with risk. Why, why ain't you don't find the angel in clean? It's much too politicized. Uh, you don't find them in biotech. It, this is more or less research R&D. Um, the solar industry in Germany is a joke. 60% of all installed solar capacity in the world is in Germany in a country which has 61 sunny days. Why is it in Germany? Because of government funding and throwing 18 billion each year in that system. It's an incredible nonsense they do. And, they, they, and, and then they say that's uh, climate. So but, um, that, that's for the politicization. On the risk management, average angel, you probably have 40% of angel investment. Exit is through uh, depreciation or write off. Uh, uh, three, maybe two or three are living dads. Uh, one or two, maybe so-so, and maybe one or two, and two, pretty good. And you may have a home run, but then you need home runs if you're, you have a venture capital uh, investor who invests in a later stage and has a home run of 10, uh, has, has a home run with uh, uh, money or equity 10 times back. Uh, compared to an angel, that would be for the angel probably a hundred times of money back. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a complete different risk award uh, uh, profile. And the only way to do that is not investing in one, not investing in 10, not investing in 20, but in much more and many more investments in smaller amounts. And then you may do add on investments. But what you see basically is. Um, failure comes early, uh, success takes long. And I don't understand the people who talk about this is not a long-term thing. We, most of our angel investments even is five to seven years. And uh, so there's nothing like one or two. You, you may have once or, or twice a thing where you have an early uh, uh, trade sale. That, that's okay. But basically, uh, if this, is, uh, if this is not going to happen. And uh, we, therefore, I, I tell you, I'm, I live in Europe, but we uh, invest more in angel money in the U.S. Uh, than in Europe. Uh, I would rather say Europe is a great place. That's my last sentence, I promise. It's a great place to spend money, uh, but uh, the U.S. may be a better place to make money. Mike Hopkins is not here, is he? Because Mike Hopkins at Spru has just done a study that finds that the reason that VC is more successful in the U.S. is precisely actually due to the stock market in the U.S., which scales up hmm. the investment. So it's actually a difference hmm. in the stock market. There is another food chain in this. That's true. Gordon, right. on Paul's and question and then... Okay. Killing and... Mm. So I agree with the, the, the rest of the panel here. What, what you have is a, a portfolio of businesses, some of which may have some potential. For the venture capitalist, it's a series of options, which he or she may choose to take or to decline. And once a fund has been raised, the biggest constraint by far to the general partnership is their time, not the money, the time of their high quality people. And so the least desirable outcome is to waste a great deal of time, care and attention and consulting on firms that are not going to meet the metrics that you need. I mean, a, a return of 10%, 8% may be very attractive to, to some, but for a venture capitalist that has got to at least talk about a return of the order of 
15, 15. 15. 15. Well, yeah. in the home runs. In the home runs, yeah, but, but in mm -hmm. to his institutional investors, mm -hmm. he's looking ideally yeah. uh, in high teens as a private venture capitalist. Mm -hmm. uh, these, these activities are untenable. Their cost is far too high. So what you see in the venture capital industry is a very clear process of selection over time against the metrics that the entrepreneurs and the venture capitalists have put together. So this is an industry where efficient killing is absolutely central to the activity. And probably one of the criticisms uh, for many of the earlier public schemes, particularly if they were regional, is it is very unattractive to kill the pet products, yeah, projects exactly. of your local MP yeah. who helped you get the funding in the original case. Or if you're a business angel, and many business angels were appallingly untrained at what they did, I mean the huge variance in the skills in business angels, is the fact that if you kill it, you lose your money, so you hang on. So the professional business angels by far are those people with very, very sharp knives, cold stares, and bloody hands. Uh, and if you want to be successful, then you've got to be prepared to have a lot of yeah. blood on your hands. <laughs> um, we hands we are honored also to have someone from the Ministry of Science and Technology in China, Yu Shi, who's currently working also at the OECD. Did you want to bring in a Chinese perspective? or? Okay, thank you. <laughs> this is an interesting panel here, and uh, I'd like to uh, thank you for all your attention to China. <laughs> and you, you seem familiar with the case of China, and uh, I'd like to respond of a, a few points here, maybe. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, the roles of angel and uh, we venture capitals, and I think we, we have this kind of, in China, uh, this uh, growing route that financing the uh, SMEs, which are technology-based, that this kind of uh, route plan is about 10 years ago, and it start from the seed fund, like the SBIR, we have the similar funds in China, we call it uh, uh, science and technology based uh, uh, innovation fund for, uh, uh, innovation fund for uh, science and technology based SMEs. Uh, and this kind of uh, the first uh, stage, and after that will be the angels, at that time, there's no angels in China. <laughs> exactly, the, the capital cap, uh, the capital market is not uh, for material. Uh, and uh, after that, the stage come to the venture capitals, and then to the um, bankers, like the and the others, and the capital market to IPO. Like kind of this kind of facilitating <coughs> plan for the uh, enterprises to grow, uh, which are innovative. Uh, and the other sign is uh, I want to point out is that the uh, uh, topic of this session is a public-private uh, uh, kind of uh, alignment for for financing the innovation. Um, for me, it's uh, interesting that uh, to, to to know that uh, in Europe that in Europe here, maybe in UK, and it's difficult for you to align the uh, private sectors in the process of financing innovation, because it's, um, it's to, to our minds in, in the Chinese context, we think uh, uh, Western countries are more market oriented, and you should have more <laughs> that kind of private uh, role, uh, more important than the government. So, uh, and in China's case, we have the opposite, that we have the planned economy for quite a long history, and uh, so we have now uh, go to a new era, kind of, um, to align more private, uh, how to say, to, to align more private sectors into the uh, financing issues, uh, including the innovation. Uh, so, um, some of my colleagues, even uh, they in the local government, municipal government, they they said that the, the treasury uh, department want to even give all the money to the venture capitals that they will have the screen uh, system for them. They will 
just uh, uh, distribute the money for innovation, for technology uh, innovation projects, that kind of things. But it's really another extreme. And uh, for me, I personally think that there should be a, a middle stage which we should stand uh, that to bring the public and the private um, power together to work on the uh, issue of financing the innovation. Uh, we, we shouldn't go either side of, to the extreme that uh, the public, uh, um, just uh, public money in a way that uh, we used to spend and uh, it, or just give the public money to the uh, mm -hmm. private sector. That's okay. it. Can I just make a quick comment? Yes, and then <coughs> we should probably close yeah. down at Very the doors. One of the things we do need is we need information. We need information on evaluations. We need to understand how the performance of public and private venture capital uh, firms and funds work. You won't get this from the, the private sector. They guard with their lives true performance figures. The public sector, and people like Christian and Weixfond and, and the Scandinavians, particularly the Finns included, and now the British government has finally released a performance review uh, uh, done uh, by us uh, on the venture capital performance in the UK is really important. The OECD is looking at this, but what we have is a very partial view. Mm -hmm. There are hundreds mm -hmm. of programs, but very few of them have been robustly mm -hmm. and rigorously mm -hmm. evaluated. And it's really important we share because China is going to make some really horrendous mistakes because you're trying to accelerate an industry mm -hmm. that has taken 30, 40 years to develop in the US and Europe. And in many cases, that is going to be a very, very painful experience. So there is an awful lot of industry that can be shared actually from, from the West, and not just California. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so we are gonna, well, first of all, let's give an applause.